<laughs> Welcome to Coventry Cathedral's live stream Good Friday service. My name is Christopher and I'm standing in the little chapel here at Bishop's House where I live next to the Cross of Nails. Though we are not able in the present conditions to be in our beloved cathedral, the cathedral's worship continues throughout this time. And so we gather now for our solemn commemoration of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I will be leading the service with Dean. Let us pray. Almighty Father, look with mercy on this your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given into the hands of wicked men and to suffer death upon the cross, who is alive and glorified with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high, just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals, so he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressions 
yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And are so far from my salvation, from the words of my distress. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer, and by night also, but I find no rest. You are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forebears trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They put their trust in you and were not confounded. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him deliver him if he delights in him. But it is you who that took me out of the womb and laid me safe upon my mother's breast. On you was I cast ever since I was born. You are my God. Even from my mother's womb. Be not far from me. For trouble is near at hand. And there is none to help. Mighty oxen come around me. Fat bulls of Bashan close me in on every side. They gape upon me with their mouths, as it were a ramping and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has become like wax, melting in the depths of my body. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my gums. You have laid me in the dust of death. For the hounds are all about me. The pack of evildoers close in on me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stand staring and looking at me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. Be not far from me, O Lord. You are my strength. Hasten to help me. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to John When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, procuring a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? Jesus. Jesus. I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom do you seek? Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Of I told you that I am he. So, if you seek me, let these men go. 
This was to fulfil the word which he had spoken, Of those whom you gave me I lost no one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews seized Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had given counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. As this disciple was known to the high priest, he entered the court of the high priest along with Jesus, while Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the maid who kept the door, and brought Peter in. The maid who kept the door said to Peter, Are you not also one of this man's disciples? I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire, because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all Jews come together. I have said nothing secretly. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? If I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They said to him, Are you not also one of his disciples? I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a kinsman of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the cock crowed. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was early, they themselves did not enter the Praetorium, so that they might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them, and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have handed him over. Take him yourselves, and judge him by your own law. It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. This was to fulfil the word which Jesus had spoken to show by what death he was to die. Pilate entered the praetorium again, and called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight, that I might not be handed over to the Jews. But my kingship is not from the world. So you are a king. You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again, and told them, I find no crime in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. Will you have me release for you the king of the Jews? Not, Not this, this man, man, but Barabbas. Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him, saying, Hail, Hail king, king of, of the, the Jews! Jews. Pilate went out again, and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no crime in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Here is the man! When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify, crucify him, him! Crucify him! Take him yourselves, and crucify him, for I find no crime in him. We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard these words, he was the more afraid. He entered the praetorium again, and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. 
You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Upon this, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If, if you, you release, release this man, man you, you are not Caesar's, Caesar's friend. friend. Everyone who makes himself a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Pavement, and in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. Away, away with, with him. him. Away, away with him. him. Crucify him. him. Shall I crucify your king? We, we have, have no, no king, king but, but Caesar. Caesar. Then he handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the Skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this title. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. The chief priests of the Jews then said to Pilate, do, Do not, not write, write the, the king, king of the, of the Jews, Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Jews. What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts, one for each soldier. But his tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfil the scripture. They parted my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did this. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfil the scripture, I thirst. A bowl full of vinegar stood there, so they put a sponge full of the vinegar on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Okay.
Who are you? Pilate wants to know who Jesus is. Where do you come from? He wants to know where Jesus comes from. And so Pilate interrogates Jesus. They tell me you're a criminal, he says, but you don't seem like a criminal to me. You purport to be a king, but you're not like a king that I've ever known. Here you are as a victim, and yet you seem to be the one who is in control in some way I can't quite understand. Who are you, Jesus? Where do you come from? Those questions of identity, Jesus's identity, run through the whole of John's Gospel. The answer, in its fullness, comes after Jesus' resurrection, where there's an encounter between Jesus and his disciples. And Thomas says of the risen Jesus, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God. The extraordinary, assumption busting claim of Good Friday that redefines the whole concept of God is that God truly comes to us not only to live out the conditions of human life but to suffer the horrors of human death, even in its worst form. I'd like to put that claim alongside a verse from our Old Testament reading, which at this time of our own history stands out to us, perhaps in a new way. Words that were, that have been by Christians, ancient words that have been by Christians applied to Jesus. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Earlier in the week, I was sent a painting by um, one of the readers, one of the ministers in the Diocese of Coventry, Marie Calvert. And you can see it here on the screen. It is a painting of one of the Stations of the Cross, the third, where, where Jesus falls for the third time. And it's very much inspired by this verse. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our transgressions. Marie the Archangel, the Corona Cross. The cross is covered in viruses. Blue for the coronavirus. Other strange shapes appear at each of the cross. Influenza at one end, Ebola at another, HIV at another, and the Marger, Marburg virus that perhaps few have heard of at another end of the world, signify all those viruses that are at work in our world which we do not know. The Christian claim is that the man of sorrows, who is acquainted with our infirmity, who carries our sicknesses, that this is none other than God in the form of a servant, a suffering servant, experiencing our weakness, carrying our infirmities, bearing 
our sickness. But how does this help us in the midst of our own crisis? What can this bring to us in the midst of the corona crisis? Well, it can help us in three ways, I suggest. First, it tells us that God knows this suffering. God knows the suffering that comes from disease. That God is with us in it. Second, it tells us that God has found a way through this suffering of humanity. The death that disease brings. The painting has shades of light ahead of the cross as Jesus carries the cross bearing our infirmities forward. There will come new light and we always even on this day stand on the side of the resurrection where we see new life not only for Jesus but for all creation. The risen Jesus who later meets Thomas is the one who has brought into being the new creation where death shall be no more and mourning and sorrow and sighing and sickness have been wiped away. And third, this stupendous claim of Good Friday that God came into the midst of human suffering, experiencing the pain of human death. That this belief that through these events of history, God has recreated the creation and a new creation awaits us. The third help that this belief of Good Friday brings to us is that this new creation which awaits us, which has been remade in Jesus through his going through death and coming out into risen life, that this new future for humanity can come into our present as we pray. And so every time we pray, the prayer that Jesus taught us, thy kingdom come, we are praying for that new creation to come to our present life. We are praying for a sign of the new creation coming into our present. We're praying perhaps we may see it as Noah sent out the dove in the midst of the flood that was engulfing humanity. And the flood and the, the dove came back to Noah with olive leaves in its beak, signifying that there was a new future, a new world in which the waters will have subsided and life will resume. And so on this Good Friday, knowing that God is with us, that God will see us through, we pray in the power of the cross and in the power of the resurrection of Jesus. God's kingdom to come. And so we join now in the proclamation of the cross, the cross by which death and defeat and disease is defeated by the power of God's healing love.
We glory in your cross, O Lord. And praise you for your mighty resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come into our world. We keep silence in homage to the crucified Christ. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise you for your mighty resurrection. For by virtue of your cross into the world. Let us pray now to the Father, through his Son, who suffered on the cross for the world's redemption. Bless all who work and pray for the unity of the church. Give to Christian people everywhere a deep longing to take up the cross and enter into its mysterious glory. Bless the bishops, unworthy as we are, the clergy and readers of this diocese, our cathedral community, and the community of the cross of nails throughout the world. Strengthen those who are preparing for baptism and confirmation, especially those who have had to wait for their baptism and confirmation due to take place at Easter. Be with them and their teachers, sponsors and families. Teach us all what it means to die and rise with Christ and ready them with us to receive your spirit. Look in your mercy on this world for love of which you gave your son to suffer and die. Bring peace to its troubled world, healing to its wounds. Strengthen those in our National Health Service and all those throughout the world who work to bring your healing and to share your reconciliation while at such a cost upon the cross. Bring healing to all who suffer pain and injustice, especially the poor and dispossessed, and those known to us. Help the lonely and the betrayed, the suffering and the dying, to find strength in Christ's companionship and in his passion to know their salvation. Welcome into paradise all who have left this world in your friendship. According to your promises, bring them with all your saints to share in the benefits of Christ's death and resurrection. At the foot of the cross, let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Most merciful God, 
We by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved us all. Granted by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.